Welcome back students. This time around we're going to take a look at the muscular system. In this video we're going to look at the overview of the anatomy and the physiology of the muscle system. In subsequent videos we're going to take a look at the anatomy and then the physiology associated specifically with the skeletal muscle system. A good place to start would be to take a look at where the word muscle came from. The word muscle uh, comes from the origin in Latin of mus. Mus means little mouse. Little mouse, the appearance of a little mice running under bed sheets, if you want to think about it. It looks very similar to, say, the bicep contracting. When we take a look at muscle tissue, we find that 40% of the overall body mass is composed of muscle tissue. This muscle tissue is going to be mostly composed of muscle cells. And one of the oddities that confuse students frequently is that we also will call muscle cells muscle fibers. Now, the only other time that you use the word fiber, it's usually associated with a protein, specifically a structural protein. But here we associate it with a cell. So please don't let that confuse you, uh, because this is the only unique situation in which we will do that. Possibly the reason why we call it a, a fiber is because of the appearance of the muscle cells under a microscope. They're going to be elongated, which means they look a lot like a straw. And by looking like that, they give the appearance of almost dense connective tissue at times. One of the key roles of muscles, the only major role of muscles, regardless of which muscle type we look at, is their ability to contract. This contracting will allow us to move, uh, either move our body externally, walking, talking, those kind of things with skeletal muscle moving blood through the cardiovascular system by the heart pumping, those are going to be cardiac muscle cells contracting, or by moving digestive materials to the digestive system through the urinary system and air through the respiratory system. In that case, that would be our smooth muscles. In either situation though, the muscles to function properly will have to find some form of energy. Now in our case, when we're talking about locomotion, you're talking about mechanical energy. But where does the mechanical energy come from? Well, previous lectures you found out that there's a variety of different forms of energy. Mechanical being one of them, but chemical being the other one. What we do with our muscles for locomotion to occur is we convert chemical energy in the form of ATP into mechanical energy for the contractions to occur. We'll look at that when we get to physiology. There's some common prefixes also associated with muscle tissue. Issue. There is the mis, mo, and sarco. So when you see those prefixes, always tied into the muscular system. Now there are three types of muscle tissues. The first being skeletal, the second being cardiac, and the third being smooth. Here you see represented on the screen some of the common unique features associated with each one of those. If we're looking at skeletal, we're going to find that skeletal is always associated with bones. Cardiac is always going to be found in the heart wall. It makes up the vast majority of that mass of the heart. Uh, the only thing that's there that's really not the cardiac cells, cardiac tissue, is going to be the fiber skeleton. And then we're, uh, smooth is going to be everywhere else that we have the need for movement. Uh, like I mentioned earlier in the digestive system, we've got to milk things through the digestive system rhythmically. We will use smooth muscle to do that. Now their appearance under the microscope slide you can see at the bottom of this slide. On the left hand side you can see that the, that the skeletal muscle is, is, is striated. Striated means that it has light and dark band alterations. These are consistent throughout the length of cross-sectional cut and it'll much, look much like a give it and allow the skeletal muscle to have the appearance of, of earthworms scurrying around in the bottom of a paper sack if you want to. Cardiac is also going to be striated but very lightly. Instead cardiac is more frequently the distinguishing characteristic of it. It's what's known as interchelating disc. Now, uh, interchelating disc is where one cell, the end of one cell, overlaps and fuses with the beginning of the next cell. And what that does is that creates an area that's quite, twice as dense. And that area, when stained, is going to give you appearance of a band, as you can see in the image below. Smooth muscles do not have striation. Another unique characteristic associated with uh, muscle tissues is how are they regulated? What nervous system controls them? With the skeletal muscle, it's the voluntary nervous system, also known as the somatic nervous system. Now, the voluntary nervous system requires me to physically think for that contraction to occur, which is a good thing because it controls my walking, it controls my talking, it controls those kind of features that I physically have to think about or train 
Uh, they don't come innate to me outside of the knee jerk reaction and the muscle twitches that occur with skeletal muscles. The rest of those are conscious activities. I don't walk in my sleep unless I've got some kind of disorder. On the other hand, cardiac and smooth, they share the involuntary nervous system, also known as the autonomic nervous system. And if you remember the, the, the branches of the autonomic, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Involuntary means that I don't have to consciously think for these muscles to contract. They will do it rhythmically and they will set their own pace, meaning that uh, they will beat without me having to think about them, for instance, or contract. It's a great thing when you think about the heart. If you knew me, you'd know I was quite absent-minded. I would have forgot to tell my brain, have my brain tell my heart to beat. If I had to use the voluntary nervous system to do that, I would have died several years ago. Now, that advantage of having a voluntary nervous system, though, is that the skeletal muscles are also fed by very myelinated, very thick nerves, neurons, which means that when I need them to kick in, when I need them to contract, they can contract very quickly and very forcefully. The only limitation of that is how quickly can I get energy back to them to replenish the energy I use for that initial contraction. Thus, they do have a limit to them, and the limit is the ability to get the energy back to them, so they tire very easily. Whereas cardiac and smooth, they typically do their thing rhythmically. When you take a look at the heart, it beats at a resting state unless excited by the uh, involuntary nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system to beat at a quicker rate. If you think about smooth muscles, smooth muscles going to be found in digestive system, urinary system, respiratory system, those kind of places. I typically do that rhythmically, and the rhythm or the pace change is based upon demands. Metabolically, though, where do they get their energy from? Both skeletal and smooth can use anaerobic mechanisms to get their energy, but remember the limitations to anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration uh, has a, a negative byproduct called lactic acid, and that lactic acid, when it builds up inside that cell, can cause the pH to change and cause enzymatic activities to start functioning less efficiently. So we have to design our cells so that they can accommodate that anaerobic. If you were to take a look and compare a smooth muscle to a skeletal muscle, you'd find that a skeletal muscle is 10, 20 times larger in diameter than what you'd find in a smooth muscle. The bigger the muscle, the more lactic acid it can, it can store before, it call, before that lactic acid has a negative effect inside that cell. So skeletal muscles are usually much more adapt at doing anaerobic than smooth muscle ever will be. I can prove it to you that smooth muscle one. If you ever think about putting yourself in an emergency a situation after you've just eaten a meal and you're trying to digest, the wise tell mother always would tell you not to go swimming after you've eaten. There is a rationale to that one. If you go swimming, all the, uh, the blood has to be sequestered to the skeletal muscles. Depleting the blood supply to the digestive system, thus depleting the oxygen supply necessary for aerobic respiration for those smooth muscles that are contracting as they're milking the food through your digestive tract. Thus, those smooth muscles start generating their energy anaerobically, building up lactic acid. Next thing you know, you're swimming and you've got a stomach cramp. Nucle uh, the number of nuclei associated cell really is only unique if you start looking at how a mature muscle cell is designed. With a smooth and a cardiac, those mature cells are typically the cells that were embryonic just grown up, gotten larger. Take a look at the skeletal muscle cell, though, on the other hand. Skeletal muscle cell is going to be multi, 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 multi nucleated, maybe 100, 200 nuclei associated with them. And this unique characteristic of a skeletal muscle cell comes from the simple fact that during development of that muscle, what happened was a series of embryonic skeletal muscle cells fused their little cell membranes together. And by doing so, they created one large muscle cell that can expand the entire length of a muscle from origin to insertion. That might be 14 to 16 inches in length, but they kept all the nuclei. So you could theoretically, if you could pull one muscle cell away from the muscle and examine it, you would probably find the number of uh, embryonic cells it took to make it by simply counting the number of nuclei that you have. 
Common characteristics associated with muscle cells is all muscle cells are excitable, irritable. And what does that mean? That means that they can receive and respond to a stimulus. Most frequently they receive and respond to an, a, an electrical stimulus and they do that through the ability to utilize neurotransmitters that cause contractions to occur. But hormones can do it as well as chemicals as well as a change in pH can. All muscle cells have contractility, which means that when stimulated appropriately, they will shorten in their body length. That's called a contraction. They are also extensible. They have extensibility, which means that they can stretch a little bit past normal resting state, which is a good thing. Otherwise, we'd be tearing a whole lot more muscles uh, than we typically do when we exercise. We have micro tears, but not major tears because of their extensibility. And they're elastic. Once, they, once the irritant, once the stimulus has, has ceased, that muscle can go back to resting state, which is much like a rubber band. Once you stretch it, it can go back to its resting state. Common functions, all muscles are responsible for uh, the movements that occur in our body. The locomotion of the body is skeletal. Pumping the blood would be cardiac. Milking contents through the internal visceral organs, that would be associated with our smooth muscle. That process of milking uh, uh, food and urine through, the, uh, through the, the systems is known as peristalsis. Posture is a common feature, but usually associated with the skeletal, where we will pose gravity stabilizing joints so that when you walk uh, the joints don't separate too much and heat production is a common thing that most folks don't think about but remember when we were talking in metabolism that when you take foodstuffs and you convert it to ATP that that conversion is only 55 to 60 percent efficient in converting the chemical bond energy found in the foodstuffs to chemical bond energy in the form of ATP the rest of it goes off as heat energy that's non-reusable, but very important. It makes us a warm-blooded organism. But there are times we put ourselves in an environment that's quite cold, and we have to have some mechanism to generate heat artificially. Ever wonder why you stood out at a football game or some other event in the middle of the night when it's cold, watching your kids or watching your siblings, and your teeth start chattering, you start shivering? All that is skeletal muscle contractions, because when you do those muscle contractions, you've got to replace the energy you just burned in the form of ATP with new ATP molecules. To do that, you typically have to make the ATP by breaking down foodstuffs, thus generating the heat. Think about it, sort of neat. And I'll talk to you next time around to look at the anatomy of the skeletal system.